insulin spikes. So maybe indeed the culprit is the glucose-induced glycemia, and um, maybe that's the other culprit, one other culprit in the development of the adverse effects of sugar. So here are our conclusions. The hepatic substrate overload induced by excessive consumption of fructose is a more rapid pathway to metabolic dysregulation than the increased free fatty acids in the post-meal hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia induced by consumption of glucose. The unregulated metabolism of fructose in the liver leads to upregulated de novo lipogenesis and uric acid production. However, the detrimental effects of sugar appear to be mediated more by more than just hepatic fructose overload. The glucose component in high fructose corn syrup may be interacting with the fructose component thus causing even higher increases in some outcomes, specifically LDL, ApoB, non-HDL cholesterol. Finally, given that fructose and glucose-containing sugars and energy are overconsumed by most people, it is likely that hepatic fructose overload, post-meal glycemia, and enlarged insulin-resistant adipocytes are all involved in the epidemic of metabolic syndrome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's time. Actually, this is the first time I've ever finished before I ran out of time. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> You guys are more interested in policy than <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> yes. Um, so I wonder, we're almost always having glucose coursing through our liver. So do you think it's the high fructose corn syrup specifically, or fructose with the glucose is always there as well? Um, at this point, don't know for sure. I don't think we've done enough study to um, say for sure. I didn't do like the equivalent study with sucrose versus fructose. And so I can't answer that. Um, uh, we just are gonna have to find out, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, actually our, we tried that in our lab because we actually were trying to get money from you know one of our many futile attempts from NIH to compare f fruit sugar with um, as you know sugar sweetened beverage or any form of sugar and um, one of the criticisms we got from the reviewers was people can't eat 25 percent of their calories as fruit so I sent home my entire staff with 25 percent of their energy requirement as whole fruit Reviewers aren't always stupid. <laughs> Four of them could not eat all the fruit. The three that did eat all the fruit came back and said, I did, but I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> so um, I think it's very rare that a person is, you know, built up you know, the habit to consume fruit at 25% of energy. <clears throat> I kind of think no. Because for all, one, like I said, people were griping about our salad. I can't eat this much. There were way fewer calories in that salad than in the beverage. So I think, no, you just simply can't because it's not easy to fit that much fruit in your diet. But also, you know, all that fiber, all those vitamins and minerals, who know? I mean, it's not... The number of variables we are looking at when we compare a sugar-sweetened beverage to a whole fruit is mind-boggling. <laughs> all those nutrients, all that fiber, um, 
there are many possible mechanisms why you couldn't get, get fat on fruit. Um, <laughs> yes? I've seen accounts that, um, that, that high fructose corn syrup could be like 55% fructose and up to like 65%. Does that, does that have any bearing? I mean, did you, did you control for that, or does that have any bearing on what you looked at? In our study, um, we obviously ordered the high fructose corn syrup, 55, and um, we tested it, and it, it was 55, and we have batches from each new barrel of high fructose corn syrup. So in our case, we know it was 55%, but I do think um, Michael's data suggesting that it isn't always 55% in our beverages is fascinating. And it does make you wonder what's going on in the manufacturing plants, how much leeway they have, and or how much quality control there is. And of course, in the industry-funded studies where they rebutted Michael's results and say, no, look at it, it's 55.0 exactly, well, they handpicked. They didn't go to the store and randomly select the beverages off the store. They picked beverages that were, you know, made according to the specifications. So that study proves probably that no, the high fructose corn syrup or the glucose in the can of high fructose corn syrup doesn't continue to isomerize and turn into fructose over later, but it doesn't prove anything about what's happening at the manufacturing plants. Mm -hmm. Yes? That's an interesting question in terms of all our studies, our subjects were told to drink the beverage with their meals. So whether that's slow down entry of you know, how quickly the fructose and how much overload we got or not, I can't say. Would our results be different if we did a smaller breakfast, then two hours later their beverage? and then two hours later, lunch, and then two hours later, a beverage. It would be interesting, a really interesting study to know, but no, I don't know. <laughs> There's a question. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, our baseline, I mean, our, ends are not huge enough to for sure answer that. But I will tell you this, I actually think our um, subjects, our older overweight subjects showed less pronounced effects than our younger subjects. And it's possibly a threshold, I mean, that they were already up there considerably and so in some ways, and even in terms of responses to glucose, we saw more adverse effects in our younger, healthier subjects. For example, when our older subjects showed absolutely no increase when they consumed glucose in uric acid, whereas I don't know if you noticed, but there was a significant increase, not as big, but still a significant increase in uric acid in the subjects consuming glucose in the shorter study, but they are all younger. So uh, I think that's more the trend I saw. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Hi, I'd like to take a stab at your fatty acids and glucose. Oh, okay. Um, so as I'm running down the list, if you incubate fat cells with insulin, you release glycerol, but not fatty acids. But two other things. One is that it's conceivable, but I don't know that this is the answer, that insulin can activate lipoprotein lipase and you can get itraluminal hydrolysis of fatty acids. But the other thing, sitting, standing here, thinking about it, I'm pretty sure many years ago, Landsberg and Young showed that when they injected insulin and glucose, they activated the sympathetic nerve system. That could be. 
So I should look up Young, you think? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick Stuart. comment. Uh, I, I can fully well believe that people unaccustomed to eating so much fruit and vegetables would have trouble with 25% of energy. But uh, we did a trial a bit ago where we asked people to eat five a day. Uh, uh, actually, to eat them five a day or drink them five a day, which mm. was actually the purpose of the study to compare solid versus liquid. Uh -huh. But both groups gained weight o over time. Uh, they did. The, the energy from fruit is real energy. And okay. if it's supplementing your diet, it will lead to weight gain eventually. Were they on ad lib? They could, yeah. they they, could they cut on, down they if they wanted. They could do whatever wanted. they wanted on their diet. They just had to have five a day uh, in our protocol. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I needed to know that. <laughs> I'll be ready the next time I get asked that question. <laughs> okay.